what's happening inside of us when we get an unction or pressure to wait, but we refuse to obey? Why don't we wait on the Lord? Today, I hope to give you a new perspective using scripture that possibly explains why we do not wait on the Lord. I will warn you, though, this is something that many people are not willing to admit. You know, it's the kind of truth that you've got to really embrace. So they may not be ready to admit this, but it is real. So... Welcome back to Maintenance Monday. You know the drill. Like, share, subscribe, watch, comment. Don't forget to leave your impression. Share the word of God so that other people can get what God is putting out. Amen. What, what the Lord is saying. We are going to get into the lesson and we're going to start with a story that may possibly, again, give us an explanation for why we refuse to wait. And yes, I've intentionally used the word refuse to wait. This is something that I don't think that we take enough time and to understand and really get the gist of why won't I wait? Why am I refusing to wait? And sometimes we got to be real about the fact that you may be indeed refusing to wait. Okay, so I want us to be made aware that we may not say things out loud that reveal our heart posture or our disposition to others, but you and I, and most of all, God knows exactly where we are when we're there. So this story is going to be coming from 2 Kings, right? It's coming from 2 Kings, and it first talks about, it shows us the hand of God, and it begins to show us how God has given Elisha, right, power, right? How God has really given him power. And then it goes on to talk about Two kings and a prophet. So the two kings are king, the king of Israel and the king of Syria and the prophet Elisha. So the king of Syria decides he's going to make war with the king of Israel. He calls all his people together and he tells them what he's getting ready to do. Well, the prophet Elisha then lets the king of Israel know, hey, they're planning to do this like this, so don't go that route. So as a result of prophet Elijah telling the king of Israel what they were planning to do, the king of Israel heeded the word of the prophet and he was able to escape the trap. Now, side note, let that be a note to us. If we would heed the word of the Lord, we could probably be saved. We could definitely be saved and protected from snares and traps that have been set for us that we didn't know exist if we would just listen. To what the Lord is saying. So, okay, so the king of Syria has got this plan. He's getting ready to go up against king of Israel. He gonna catch them by surprise, but he was surprised when prophet Elisha told the king of Israel what the king of Syria was going to do. And then he became very, very angry. So he gets angry because he thinks there's a traitor in his camp. Somebody is telling king of Israel his plans. And they say, no, no, no. Look what they say in verse 12. They say, we won't take it. They say, and one of his servants said, none, my Lord. Because he's like, which one of you told the king of Israel what I'm trying to do? None, my Lord, oh king. But Elisha, okay? So they, they snitching around these parts. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy chamber. So you would think that if you're telling me there is a prophet that knows what I say, despite the fact that I haven't uttered a word, you would think that would cause him to back off. At least back off of Israel, right? But not only does he not back off of Israel, he says, oh, so somebody tell him my secrets. He don't even care about the fact that he didn't tell Elisha. He said, you know, I'm going to just go get Elisha. Okay, Elijah want to tell my business. Nobody going to tell anything that I don't tell them, right? So he says, I'm going to go get Elijah. He calls his hosts together. He calls his hosts together. He sends them to go get Elijah. And when he sends them to go get Elijah, they go and they surround Elijah. Then Elisha's prophet, I mean, his Elisha's servant, gets up just doing his regular morning routine. And he goes outside of the tent. And he looks outside of the tent and he sees an army. So he goes back into the tent and he's like, Hey, my Lord, um, I don't know if you know, but we've got company and it doesn't look like they came to break bread, right? So he tells them, he tells Elisha that they're outside and this, you got to love a true prophet of God. This is what Elisha says. Look at this. 
Elisha answers the servant that has now seen an army, right, around them. And he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And let me encourage you with that today. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now watch this. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And I love this because I love that Elijah wants him to also see the hand of God, the might of God, the, the character. That he wants him to see the power of God. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That lets you know that I am never alone. Even when it looks like I'm alone, I am absolutely never alone. Even if the whole world decides that they're going to conspire against me. I've got access. I've got resources that is more powerful than anything that this earth accessible or inaccessible in the earth has. Let that be encouragement to you that you are never alone. If you are in God, you are never alone. I've got angels that encamp around me. I've got somebody watching over me. I'm never alone and I'm not afraid. Amen. So here we've got, they come to get him, and you would think that's over. So what does Elisha do? Elisha prays to the Lord and says, Lord, strike them blind. So the Lord strikes the army blind. He leads them over to Samaria, where the king of Israel and, and, and the army of Israel is. He leads them over there. And then he says, Lord, open their eyes. So now this army that came, big bad army, came to get Elijah, have now been led by Elijah and then Elijah says, it is I. <laughs> Elijah says, it's me, I'm here. But they realize they're surrounded by Israel. Now, this is very important because I want you to understand they came to get Elisha. But instead, Elisha leads them and now they are surrounded by Israel. And look at what the king of Israel then says. He says, and the king of Israel said unto Elisha when he saw them, my father. Shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? So once again, we are able to see, come on, you don't call somebody that's not your daddy father unless there's a heart. There's some kind of affection there. There's an affinity there. So you can see that there's honor. He's honoring him. He says, my father, shall I smite them? Now you got to understand, these. this is the same, the people of the king that was just coming up against him, right? That uh, Elisha told him how to avoid the trap that they set. So now he's basically put them in his hands. They're putty. They're right here. They're vulnerable right there in his hands. And he's like, my father, shall I smite him? Shall I smite him? And he could have done whatever he wanted to do. But he didn't. And let's look at what happened. And he answered, thou shall not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword? And with thy bow, set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Come on. Then, and as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my Lord, O king. So here you got, now they, he says, should I kill him? Elisha says, don't kill them. Elisha says, instead, feed them. So now the king of Israel could have used that moment, could have used that opportunity to show that he's got the upper hand. He could have used that moment to vindicate himself, right, for any reason. He could have used that moment just to position himself as the head. But instead, this is what I want you to remember, he listened to the prophet Elisha, which is equivalent to the word of the Lord. Instead of killing them, instead of taking them captive, he did what the prophet said, feed them and send them away. That's very important. I want you to keep that in mind. So now you would think that they were very happy with what he did, but the king of Syria and a host of others decide that they're going to come and they're going to besiege Samaria. Huh? The nerve, right? So they come, they're going to besiege Samaria. And after they surround them, obviously we know that th this is this is in an effort to cause them to, to surrender. After they surround them and besiege them, the famine gets so great in the land that one of the women see the king 
and she tells them tells him a story a very true story but it is it is a heartbreaking story so viewer discretion advised right and as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall there cried a woman unto him saying help my lord O king and he said if the lord do not help thee when shall I help thee out of the barn floor or out of the wine press watch this and the king said unto her what aileth thee and she answered look how casual she's about to tell this story this woman said unto me give thy son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow so we boiled my son and did eat him and I said unto her on the next day give thy son that we may eat him and she hath hid her son this is how bad it has gotten in the land it is so bad that mothers are eating their children and making deals about it this is how bad it has gotten in the land it is so bad that they started overpricing and selling things that should never be sold and it came to pass at least the king has compassion when the king heard the words of the woman he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. This was the final straw for the king. You got to understand the king already, by the word of the Lord, he avoided a trap. By the word of the Lord, he could have subdued at least half. He could have subdued some of the people. But instead, he strengthened them. He fed them. Let them go. And then the king of Syria comes back and still creates a besiege around him when he had them in the palm of his hand. Now, they're surrounding so much so that on, on his watch, mothers are eating their children. That's how bad the famine is. So, what do you think the king's response is? Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elijah, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. He wanted to kill Elijah. He wanted to kill Elijah. You say, well, RJ, what does this have to do with waiting. Let's look at 33. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? So after having them in the palm of his hand and listening to what God told him to do, right? He says, You know what? This evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any? Why should I keep waiting on God? God's the reason I'm in this mess. And I know you may say, oh, I would never dare say that. But I want you to reconsider. I want you to reconsider that sometimes we get in situations and the truth of the matter is we don't wait on God because we despise him. We despise his way. We've been going through so much. I got in this mess because I was following you. Maybe had I, you know, uh, smited them when I asked to smite them, I might not be in this situation. Have you ever felt like I've been following God and it got me here? No, maybe you're single and you desire to honor God in your relationships, right? You're living an honorable life. You say, I'm going to honor God in my relationship. You date another supposed Christian that does not honor God in their relationship. And you find yourself constantly single because you choose to honor God. Do you then take this same approach? Honoring God, following Jesus is why I'm still single. I don't want to follow him anymore. I don't want to wait on him. Maybe you've lost someone that you love so dearly, whether it be in death or, or, or in intimacy, right? Maybe you've lost someone that you love so dearly, and you say, you know what? God had the power to keep them. God could have changed this whole situation, but he didn't. So I'm not waiting on God anymore. Maybe you were violated as a child or an adult, and your innocence was stolen. And you say, how could a God with all power in his hand Allow something like that to happen to me. God is the reason I'm in this mess. Why should I keep waiting on him? Why should I trust in him? Maybe you were already struggling to provide for your family. And then the pandemic hit. And you've been faithful in your church attendance. You've been given in the offering. You've been paying your tithe. You've been faithful. Then the pandemic hits and you are like, oh, now I can't do anything. And God forbid you lose your job. And you say, Lord, I think you forgot to rebuke the devourer for my sake. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We can end up just like this too. That we feel like following God put us in this mess. 
and I don't want to follow him anymore because I don't like the way it feels. I want you to know that maybe we haven't waited on the Lord as well, whether it's because we believe God can and so he should, or if he doesn't, then he's wrong, or whether it's we're tired of waiting and the decision um, to follow God thus far has gotten us where we are now and we don't want to be there. Um, in essence, what we are really saying is I tried it God's way. It didn't work, at least not to my liking. So I'm not seeking his will or even being obedient to what I know. Saints, sons, and citizens alike, we can be like disappointed children. We disappointed with something, then we want God to fix something. He doesn't fix it, so we throw tantrums, we get upset, we get angry, right? And we get angry with God because he didn't uphold our promises to ourselves. And we forget the God that we say we chose from the very beginning. I want to read this to you. I didn't say it, and I want to make sure I say it. Hold on. The moment, this moment right here, was where we're able to see in our own lives, whether it be because of anger, frustration, disappointment, or hopelessness, we conclude that God put us in this mess, and we're not waiting for him any longer. So I challenge you today that the next time you find yourself in this situation, put your heart on the stand. And ask your heart, where has God disappointed me before? That's causing me not to trust him now. That's causing me not to want to wait on him now. What did he do last time that put me in this situation here? And then say, heart, clean your heart and get the bitterness out of your heart against God. Don't put God on trial. Put your heart on trial. And don't be anxious. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be hasty. And don't be hopeless. Because God is the source of our hope. Remember to like, share, subscribe. Love you. Next week on Maintenance Monday. In whatever state that you are in, pursue, seek the will of the Father. We can rest under seat. I want you to know that there is a man to his madness. And I'm here to expose his schemes today. It's Maintenance Monday.